And right now it's time for that time when we have our special guest. Tonight's special guest is Ray Columbus. Ray is a classic entertainer and is in the hearts and the minds of every baby boomer who grew up in New Zealand through the 60s and the 70s. We welcome Ray Columbus as our special guest on The Beat Goes On. Ray Columbus. Hi, dear. Ray Columbus, no. welcome to The Beat Goes On. It's now, a pleasure to be here. If anybody could um, claim that the beat was going on, it was Ray Columbus, because how long is it now since Ray Columbus has had a beat going on in his, in his life? Well, since I was six, as far as being on stage. Yes. So that's you know going back 60 years. 60 my, my years. My God. Ah. But in terms of um, my rock and roll career and pop career, it's probably more since... Uh, 1958. You're always attracted to the beat. There was something about music and yeah. that, that got Ray Columbus's blood going. His dad wanted me to be Fred Astaire, so yeah. he put me on stage to be a singing tap dancer. And, um, and I did that for 10 years and I was quite successful, especially once I got near, you know, right into my teens, I started to do well. But then I discovered James Dean and Elvis Presley. I was working in the movie theatre selling ice creams and sweets, so I got to see Blackboard Jungle and East of Eden oh, and yeah. all these they great movies, movies. Yeah. Uh, with James Dean and whatever. And um, I decided I was going to spend the next couple of years of my life, I was just going on 14, preparing Dad for my switch from Fred to Elvis, <laughs> <laughs> which uh, he was a bit shocked at. But, but I was looking like a cockatoo and um, I was a bit of a teddy boy, bodgy type guy. And the way I was dressing and... Um, the way I looked, the way I wore my hair and things. So he was getting more and more... Um, edgy about it. Huh? Edgy and embarrassed a bit yeah. by me, uh, by the way I was looking. It's a never-ending never story, isn't it, about what Dad well, thinks about us? I used to meet him at the pie cart. We'd often, uh, I'd go out on the town and I'd go to the pie cart afterwards in the Cathedral Square. And I'd, I'd see Dad down the end and I'd say, Hi, Dad, and he'd go, Hi, John. <laughs> he didn't even want to see me. He didn't even want to be seen with me because yeah. I looked so radical. Yeah. And it was just, yeah. you know, walking art form. Yeah. Was, well, what did your dad do? What was your, what was your dad? He was a bartender. He wanted to be a singing star. He wanted to be an entertainer. He was a good singer. He's a good harmonica player. But he never had the opportunity. Never. Yet. He was in the Kiba concert party for a short time during the war and after the war. And uh, he knew Stan Winera and all these great uh, entertainers. And um, he always wanted to do that. But the closest thing he could get to the nightlife was working in a pub. Oh, okay. And even though it was all after hours, you know, you know, he somehow did that. But um, well, what was the name Columbus? Where did uh, where's that from? Nicholas Columbus and his brother, I don't know his brother's name, came out from Greece and settled in the Little River, in Banks Peninsula. Four generations ago, and um, so it's a Greek heritage. Oh yeah. Ah. But funnily enough, we just found out we couldn't understand why it was Greek. My grandma Nana always said we were related to Christopher because the name Columbus is not common. There are more streets and cities and towns in America named Columbus than there are people. Yeah. It's quite a rare name, and all the Columbuses in New Zealand are related. Yeah. Um, but recently, my niece, my brother Barry's daughter, Georgia, is studying in Toronto, in Canada. And she had this professor come to her and he said, is your name really Columbus? Is that your birth name with that spelling, U-M-B-U-S? And she said, yes. He said, tell me, where do your immediate forebears come from? And she said, Greece. And we could never understand it. And he said, ah! He said, I've been doing Christopher Columbus's family tree for years. Some say, some say that uh, Ferdinand clapped him in irons because A, he was, Chris was supposed to get a percentage of the take from discovering yeah. America and the Americas, the millions of gold and bullion and bodies and they, they got. And pay him. No, so he, and he was apparently having an affair with Isabella. Um, don't know that for sure, but that's the rumor. So he was clapped in, in jail and he died in jail, and then Ferdinand started persecuting his children, most of whom were illegitimate, so we've never been able to prove lineage. But this professor said to my niece, Christopher was Jewish, did you know he was Jewish? He was persecuted by the King of Spain, 
because he was Jewish. And I've always felt Jewish Catholic. Yeah. We were brought up Catholics. Yeah. And indeed, my, my brother and his wife are devout Catholics. To, so to find out that Chris was, and we, are potentially Jewish, I think is, <laughs> I love the idea. Yeah. <laughs> Most people who know me know I'm quite Jewish in a lot of ways. Um, so what does that make you feel to, uh, it's, maybe it's tenuous, but it could be really true that you are related to Christopher. Um, um. I've always known we were, because my grandmother doesn't tell lies, and Columbus is such a rare name. But because a lot of his children were illegitimate, it was hard to prove. But now with this a family tree being put together by this professor. It's nice to feel that we have some sort of lineage. Yeah. Because I love wonderful. history and yeah. I've always been interested in it. But what about mum? Who, who was, where, where did mum come from? My mother was a Cressy. She was English, Welsh, Scottish uh, parentage. Wonderful English rose. Sadly died in 1978, very young, 59. And I went to her family reunion in the West Coast in Hokitika a few years ago and it was just fabulous to meet all of her cousins, um, and I was, I, I took one aunt um, under my arm, she was, was a tiny little lady like my mum, and I felt really close to my mum being there, and she was, her first name was Cressy, but she was actually part of the Cressy family, their surname was Cressy, originally, and the town, the, her uh, relatives in a, in a town in England, I forget what original town it was, when King James of England were defeated the King, uh, King Philippe, Philippe, I think it was, of France, uh, in Cressy in France, mm. everybody in this English town changed their name to Cressy. Cressy. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, so, you know, my mother, and I found out through, through going to my mum's um, uh, family reunion that her, her, un her uncle and one of her brothers were very musical. Because I thought the music always came from Dad. Yeah, the Columbus side, But yes. actually, Mum was a hat designer. She was a milliner when she was in her teens for Ballantines in Christchurch. And she was very talented. So it turns out that my roots are much deeper on both sides. Um, so it's fascinating now that I should be 66 and still performing and being in the arts mm. of some description. Yes. When you left Christchurch to head for Auckland, as you said, where did you think, how, how far did you think it was going to go? Was it going to be a, a two or three years thing with playing in a band? Or did you think it would be a career as an entertainer? I never planned more than a year in advance. What had, um, so Howard Morrison, with well, the Howard Morrison Quartet, were top of the bill in the Majestic Theatre in 1962 for a Showtime Spectacular. That's right. And after they did the show, they went to the theatre manager, John Hart, who's a dear friend of mine now, and um, he's Bridgeway Theatre, you know, he's a great movie guy. He and his wife, Heather, and they're dear friends. He said, oh, there's a great little band playing across the road at the Plainsman, which was a hangout for the Operation Deep Freeze, uh, kids from south, so the southern states of the United States. He said, go and they do two shows a night, so you could go over and have a drink and catch, catch them or whatever. So the quartet came How over with the entourage. Yeah, yeah. And Howard came to see the show and was he immediately came backstage. I'd never met him before. And he said, you got to go to Auckland with this group, Master. You'll kill him. <laughs> and that was, that, I yeah. said that on to Sue with love. And it was true. He, and I thought, Sir Howard, the biggest star in New Zealand with this group, is telling me that my group is going to be competition for his group. It must be true. I mean, why would a person be so generous? Yes, um, exactly. Because we had already had offers to go from promoters, but I never trusted them. I've always had a distinct sort of mistrust of promoters. Um, but anyway, I picked up one of the contracts and said, OK, we'll come. All because Sir Howard, well, Howard as he was then, said, you'll kill him. And he was right. He was right. And we only had, you know, if it didn't work out, we'd come back. By, the, by that time, I was learning the vibes at home and doing all this sort of stuff. But within a year and a half, we're the number one group in Australia and New Zealand. Yes. To Australia four times. If it hadn't been music, what would Ray Columbus be doing today? I was uh, always a fashionista. And Lane Walker Rudkin, who have just gone under, sadly, they wanted, they used to make all of our clothes for the invaders and I, the zoot suits. I used to design the final cut of them to wear. Um, 
and they, are, they asked me if I would apply for a job as an, an apprentice cutter and designer. And I was, was always fascinated by that until I went to sign the contract. And I said, what's this figure down here? They said, oh, that's two pounds 17 and six months a week. That's how much you'll be paid gross before tax. I said, what? Two pounds 17 Two pounds 17 and six. And I said, I'm making more than that on a Saturday selling ice creams in the movie theaters. And they said, yes, but this is a long-term career. And I said, I've got a long-term career. I can be an entertainer. <laughs> I didn't have to do work for that. So I'm, there's no way I'm doing that. Yeah. And I, I'm quite confident that had I done so, I would have done all right. I've always been a fashion Easter in my brain, and it's um, just one of those things. It doesn't matter whether it's, whether it's jeans or shoes or whatever it is. But uh, And so I probably would have been a cutter and designer. I would have been in the arts somewhere. Tomorrow morning on Television One, yeah. it's celebrating on the Good Morning Show the birthday of Howard Morrison. 74 years old tomorrow. Wow. And he's requested for me to come down and... Uh, well, there have been rumours lately of his demise, which is really, you know, I would, I, somebody phoned me, uh, a broadcaster, I, I'm not even going to mention the name, I would respect normally, phoned me and wanted me to wake up early in the morning to talk about someone's uh, demise. And I said, who? These people have called me over the years for yeah. Sinatra's death, yeah. Elvis's death, Sammy Davis Jr., uh, Sammy Davis Jr., John Lennon, Tommy Adderley, and um, when they called and said, Elvis Presley died, I went, <laughs> I hung the phone up, <laughs> cried my eyes out. Mm. And they called back and my wife answered the phone. She said, oh, I can't talk to you. He's very upset. Mm. Whatever you told him, he's upset. Oh, can we call him back later? She said, whatever. <laughs> because I, I mean, she didn't even know why I would, but I, you know, they say, how do you feel about it? And so I said, who was this person? And they said, Sarah Morrison. I said, no way. Mm. He's my brother. We talk on the phone. I've been in touch with him recently. He's good. He was very frail when we did to serve with love. Mm. Uh, there's no way he's ill. They said cancer. I said, crap. Sorry about the language, but it's true. I said, crap. I said, he's, he, he had to have hip replacement, and that's why he was frail during um, to serve with love. And I was frail because I was getting over a stroke, so I couldn't sing. I was only talking but I was determined to be there. And he's like me, a very determined, he's much more determined than I am, if anything, and I don't believe this. But you've upset me greatly, so I hung the phone, and they said, will you be standing by anyway? I just hung up. Um, and so I phoned him immediately, yeah. and he was on voicemail, and I said, Howie, I've just been terribly upset by this terrible rumor that you're unwell, and you've got cancer. I know Queer, or Donna, or Howie Jr., or you, someone would have called me if you were ill. I know you, you know how much I care. Someone would have called me. So Howie called me back and he said, I'm hailing Hardy, bro. Those <laughs> bastards, you know. Said, well, you may not have said that's my language. But he went in the, on the road to a paper the next morning with a front page ad saying, I'm alive. You know, a photo, I mean. Ray Columbus, wonderful to have you. Wonderful Pleasure to have to you on the here, program. Jared. You're such a huge part of the New Zealand entertainment industry. So it's wonderful to have you here. Thank, Thank you, Ray. Thank you.